one thing we can't do. We can say, God, I blew it. I, 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 I probably had another chance. I may have done something else, but I'm asking you to forgive me for my failures. Forgive me for my ignorance. Maybe I didn't pursue it, Lord. Asking you to forgive me, and Lord, just enable me from this point to walk in your footsteps and to follow your will. Listen, all of us have had second chances, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. How many chances are all of us the grace of God? The love of God. Listen, God is not there trying to judge you. God wants to live his life in and through you, and he'll take you wherever you will surrender yourself to him. You can't do better than having Jesus, the Lord, the second verse of the Trinity, living his life in you and picking you up where you are and, and taking you on the way you had in mind to begin with. So where would you consider yourself to be as far as the will of God in your life? Maybe you said, well, I never even heard about it before. Oh, I knew about it, but I was too busy doing my own thing. I knew about it, but I had something else in mind. And here you are this morning, and you're hearing about it again. I pray that you won't ever have to hear about it another time before you surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and see what he'll do in your life. God can do an amazing work in what's left because he loves us, because he knows exactly what we need. He delights in showing us his will for our life, and I want to read you three passages of Scripture. Uh, so uh, let's, let's turn to Psalm 16. And uh, it is the 11th verse of the 16th Psalm. Listen. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Look at that. You will make known to me your path of life. Will you have to be a certain age and much wealth and talent skill? No. You ask him. So watch this. If you left church today, you went home, you got in your bedroom, you got on your knees or sat in your easy chair or whatever, and you said to Almighty God, Lord, I heard it. I messed up badly, but today I'm surrendering my life to you that for the rest of my life I want you to have your way in my life. You will be shocked at what God will do. Let me give you another verse. Psalm 32, verse 8. And uh, you, you've heard me talk about this verse probably several times. Listen to this verse, Psalm 32. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Listen to that. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. Is that by certain age? No. Certain person, no. That's his offer to all of us who are willing to listen to him. You may think, well, I've really blown it in my life. I really messed it up. I wish, I wish I'd done better. But Lord, today, whatever is left, here's my life. What will you do with me? You will be surprised at what he'll do. And so when I think, I think about these verses and think about how many times, so Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, for example, one of my favorite passages. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge him and what's his promise. He will direct your path. Just trust him. See what he'll do. So there are things that often hinder us from just being doing this. Now, I'm going to give you a quick list of them. We come by this vision and we get some excuse. So think about this. Things that hinder us from discovering the will of God, what? Number one, self will. We can't get all over what we want to do, how we want to do it. Secondly, the influence of other people. When other people influence us, oh, that won't work. Well, why would you want to try something like that? You talk to the God who works the impossible. Ignorance of the Word of God. Think about all the promises He gives us of an answer prayer. And then down. Well, I don't think I can do that in my life. Listen, the God who created this world can do anything He chooses to do, no matter what's been in the past. That's who He is. Well, it may work for somebody, but not for me because I've really blown it bad. 
God is willing to love you, forgive you, cleanse you, and give you a new beginning. Well, I'm too busy to deal with that. Listen, you don't want to die having rejected Jesus Christ. Do you think God is going to accept an excuse? Well, I would have, but I just didn't have time. There are people who are so foolishly busy, they don't have time for God. Listen, fear. Well, I know that's what God wants me to do, but I, I just don't think I could do that. Probably every preacher who's ever stood in the pulpit has told God at first, oh, I couldn't do that. I can I can stand in front of all those people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can't deliberately, willfully choose to disobey God and be happy with your life. And there are other people because of that money. They can cover up a lot of stuff. But you can't cover up a disobedient you've got millions. <laughs> cover up disobedience to God no matter what you have or who you have or whatever it might be. God has a will for your life. He loves you. He desires the best for you. And if you've missed it so far, start today and tell him, Lord, I don't know what you can do with what's left over, but God, here I am. Take me like I am. He'll forgive you, cleanse you. Let me tell you something God won't do. You don't hear? Yes. Well, somebody does. <laughs> One thing God won't do to you. He won't bring up the past and say, see that? I, I told you. Mm -hmm. See you, man. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. He doesn't throw up the past. He brings up the future of what he's able to do and can do with you. It may be late in life or early in life, but one thing is certain. He'll take you where you are. And you've got willful known sin in your life, maybe. Now watch this one. God speaks to your heart this morning in the worship service. And he already points to you. He's already said to you, but you know you have to correct this. You know you, you have to stop this. You know you have to change this. And you're sitting here thinking, oh my goodness, God, what am I going to do? You let God take you where you are and watch him do what he's able to do in your life. You listen, if you wait till you figure it out, you'll never do it. It takes surrender. God, I'm not coming to you claiming that I'm worthy of anything. I'm coming to you saying, Lord, I've messed it up. I've blown it. I've sinned against you. No more toleration or excusing. I'm just laying it before you, God. Whatever you can do with my life, God, here I am. Whatever you want to do, here I am. What do you think God will do? He'll amaze you. First thing he'll do is give you this awesome sense of peace. Forgiven. Forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. And then watch him work in your life. Watch this. You're not waiting on God. God's waiting on you. He's waiting to give you his best. In the past, he forgives and he forgets it. And he gives you the opportunity to start all over again. That's the awesome, indescribable, eternal will of God for your life. And the question is, are you willing to be, are you, are you willing to say to him, Lord, if I don't want to know, God, I'm ashamed. God, thank you for giving me one more chance. And Lord, here's my life. I want to see what you'll do with me. Here's your opportunity today. You came to church today. Here's your what opportunity. Boy, Before you walk out of this place, here's what you can do. You can say, God, I don't even know how to confess all my sin, but I'm saying to you, Lord, that I know I've blown it lots of times. I've sinned against you, haven't taken advantage of my opportunities. I believe what your goodness and love and mercy and forgiveness taught me. But today, it's best I know how. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. I'm surrendering my life to you. I probably won't do a very good job of it. I'm surrendering my life to you. And I'd say to you, dear Father, forgive me and here's my life. I want you to govern my life from this point forward. Here's my life. If you will surrender your life to God, sitting right where you are, and you don't give him any details, he knows all the details. 
All you need to say to him sincerely with all your heart, God, I messed up, I blown it, I'm sorry, I'm ashamed, I'm asking you to forgive me. And Lord, by your help, by your strength, by your wisdom, by your grace, by your goodness, by your love, your mercy, I will have sought all over again. Think about how awesome God is, that he's willing to forget your past and to learn about the future. Amen. Amen. Father, we couldn't even begin to describe how awesome you are. What grace really means. When we think about all that you forgive us for, all that you're willing to do in us and through us, we pray that the Holy Spirit will do his work right now. And that every single one of us will take a fresh look at our life and surrender ourselves totally to you again, if necessary. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Coming up in just a moment, more with Dr. Charles Stanley. There's more people searching for spiritual answers than ever before. People are scared, people are nervous, and we have the opportunity to not only deliver with excellence the best coffee, we have the opportunity to deliver the best message, the good news of the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ, and people are ready to hear it. is awesome and faithful as when you and I have no other place to turn. That we look to him, we rely upon him, because he is a God who is faithful. That means he's dependable, he's trustworthy, he's always there in every single circumstance of life in which I need him no matter what. Next on In Touch, Growing in Our Adversity. When a child is born, we naturally expect that child to grow. And so we look forward to when the child is walking, when he's two or five, maybe 13, and then 19 and 21 and 25 and on we go. Because that's the natural, normal thing to happen. And when a child does not grow, we know we have a major problem. Well, the same thing is true in the Christian life. When you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible says you're born again. So speaking of new birth, that is then we are to grow in our relationship to Christ. We're to grow in our knowledge and understanding of who He is and how He works in our life. And we're to grow in understanding of the difficult times we have and how we're to respond. So when you look at the scripture, for example, the Apostle Paul reminds us in this fourth chapter of Ephesians, in the 15th verse, he says, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects under him who is the head, even Christ. And then, of course, Peter says a similar thing in uh, 2 Peter, and uh, the last uh, verse of uh, this epistle, uh, he says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and at the day of eternity. Amen. So you can go all through the scriptures and there are many verses in the Bible about growing. That is, we're not to be saved and just stay there. If you think about how little you knew about God the day you were saved, and how little you knew about God month after you were saved, or a year after you were saved. But the Word of God, you begin to pray, and you observe how God works and is working in other people's lives, you are growing in your Christian life. And the more you and I grow in Christ's likeness, the more we are walking in the will of God and becoming the persons He wants us to be. So, uh, we talked last week about this whole idea of adversity. And today I want to talk about growing in our adversity. We're going to have adversities in our life. We're going to have those difficult times in our life. Either 
they can become setbacks in our life, or they can become times in which you and I grow into Christ's likeness and they grow into His will for our life. So what I want us to look at is this. How do we grow in those times? You can stop where you are in the midst of it, blame God, blame someone else, and what you do. Listen to this, this simple phrase, don't waste your sorrows. Now, as if I'm going to hurt, I don't want to waste them. I don't like hurt, I don't like pain, but if i got to have it, I don't want to waste it. I want to grow in it somehow, in some way. So, um, really, growing, growing spiritually during my hardship, my adversity, depends upon two things. If I'm really going to grow, the first one is this. My understanding of God's purpose for it. In other words, as a full oh, Jesus, now if you never trusted Christ as your Savior, it's something you brought on yourself, and uh, no doubt you're suffering, it's because the Bible says the wages of sin is death, and the Bible says that uh, we will reap what we sow, but we're talking about believers now who are going through adversity in their life, and so uh, we are to understand God's purpose. So I want you to be sure you jot these down because somewhere along the way you're going to see yourself on these. And one of the primary reasons I hear is God has adversity in life to get our attention. We just go along in life and doing our thing and ignoring him. Sometimes we ignore him half tries to say to us in prayer or many other ways or through someone else what he wants us to do or what he wants us to think about. We just ignore him. And so adversity comes along, and all of a sudden, he has our undivided attention. God, what are you doing in my life? A second reason, uh, which was something true according to the Apostle Paul in his life, and that is to uh, conquer pride in our life. You're doing really well. You're getting along fine. You don't have any time for anybody else. And in fact, uh, you think, well, why can't you take care of yourself? And, and why are you having such a hard time? And uh, the Apostle Paul said that the reason he felt it was God was helping him keep him from exalting himself. God had given him so many awesome privileges and understandings in this 12th chapter of the uh, uh, second Corinthians beginning in the seventh verse. He said one of the primary reasons is uh, to keep him from becoming prideful and arrogant. And if you think about what is in the book of Romans and first and second Corinthians and Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and all the rest, all the awesome wisdom you and I live by, he said, God sent him a thorn of to keep him usable, lest he become prideful and arrogant and God could not use him anymore. Then, of course, uh, one of the reasons we have adversity is to remind us of our weakness. If you think you know that you're strong and you can handle it, and you live a long life and never think to ask God to give you strength and wisdom and direction for your life, and what happens is, um, we think we're, we're, we're adequate, but God knows how to weaken us, and He reminds us of our weakness. Listen to this, not in order to keep us weak, but in order to remind us who is the source of my strength. The source of our strength is Almighty God, and sometimes we need to be reminded of that, and He knows exactly what to send into our life to remind us of that. Then, of course, one of the reasons he sends adversity in our life and allows it is in order that you and I may hate sin. Now, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, and all through the scripture, sin has its penalties. And there is heartache, there is adversity as a result of sin. And so God naturally allows the adversity of sin into the person's life who is choosing to sin against God. And he allows the suffering to come. And we, we know the principle, we quote it often. We reap what we sow more than we sow, later than we sow. And as a result, we are going to feel the impact of sin in our life. And so he allows adversity to increase our hatred of sin. And of course, uh, he allows it in our life to demonstrate his faithfulness. And sometimes we go through adversity and things are really tough. It's really bad. Maybe you live alone, for example, or you having a financial issue uh, and all of that. And what happens? God demonstrates his awesome faithfulness when you and I 
have no other place to turn. That we look to him, we rely upon him, because he is the God who is faithful. That means he's dependable, he's trustworthy, he's always there in every single circumstance of life in which I need him, no matter what. So we understand what his faithfulness is about when we're in our greatest need. Also, I think one of the reasons that he allows it in our life, and maybe we don't think this is important to us, but it's very important to God, how do we best comfort other people when we have been, either where they've been, or we've hurt with the same intensity that they've hurt with, or we go through the same sorrow, or some other issue in life where we've been deeply hurt, deeply we felt pain, deep loss in our life. Because to be able to comfort somebody is to feel with them. To, have, to be able to emotionally feel to some degree what they're going through. And the people who have been through the same pain you're going through are probably the best to understand and to identify. That is, if they're godly and if they are not selfish and are able to genuinely say to you, you know, I may not know what all you feel, but I have been there. Oh, this is things God has done in my life. But being able to comfort other people that's part of living the Christian life. If, if, if the Spirit of God is indwelling us, one of, the, one of the responses we will have is, we want to comfort somebody in their hurt and their pain. This young lady came in this morning, and she had an accident and broken her foot. And, and as soon as I saw, she was on crutches, and, and, and she, couldn't, she couldn't move. And I, I, I felt for her, because I, I've been in a situation I couldn't move apart of my body. But in other words, we should be we should be giving out all the time in our life. And if we have been comforted by God, we are like a spring of comfort for someone else. Then one of the reasons that God sends and allows uh, a person in our life is that he is ready for service. In other words, one of his primary reasons for sending adversity to our life and, and all adversity doesn't come with the same intensity. It's not all the same kind, but the difficult times, hardships and sufferings we go through in life, one of the primary reasons is to equip us to help other people. That is, uh, to, to serve the Lord in some fashion, whatever that may be. And I think uh, anybody who's uh, going to be a pastor is going to hurt. In other words, you cannot comfort other people, you cannot uphold them, you cannot lift them up and encourage them unless you felt something within yourself. And what you will discover is that people who've had it so good, they, they've had it so good in life, and they come to somebody who's hurting, they, they can't do much. They can talk, but they can't feel. They can't sense deep. They, they, they're not, in other words, if, you, if you've had no adversity, you cannot emotionally feel what somebody else is feeling. So God gets us ready to serve him in different ways. Then, of course, what is God doing? He's expressing his love. You say, wait a minute, now you're telling me that uh, adversity, God is expressing his love? Yes, he is. Listen, he loves us enough to cause us to hurt enough to surrender our life to him because he knows where we're headed is a disaster. We don't realize how dangerous we are to ourselves sometimes until God stops us and helps us understand this is not a setback. This is a moment in which God is expressing his love toward us but stopping us from heading in a direction that he knows we do not want to go. And then, of course, one of his reasons is to change our sense of direction. That was God knows exactly what it's going to take to accomplish his will in our life. Now, we said understanding God's purpose for adversity, and secondly, uh, what's the proper response? I have to see it from God. In other words, anything that comes from, watch this now. You've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. The Holy Spirit's come into your life to live, to rule, to reign. Therefore, he gives you guidance. He says, I'll guide you with my eye upon you. I'll teach you in the way we should go. So he's doing that. 
So therefore, when I come to the Word and I'm thinking about what's happening, so how do I view this from God? Because God has something in mind that I know is best. And so we, we, we will quote our favorite verse, one of our favorite verses. God causes all things to work together for good. To those who love him, to those who call the code this purpose, you've submitted your life to him in Christ. He says he'll cause something good to happen. And if you're in the word of God, and this is why I say you, you should read some portion of the word of God every day. Because sometimes it's just exactly, it, it's just, it's just tailor-made for you because he knows what's going to happen that day. And so our response ought to be something like this. God, what's your goal for this in my life? I know you don't just let these things happen. What's your goal? And I learned a long time ago, if, I, if I'm going to hurt, if I'm going to have pain, I'm going to suffer about something, glean the most I can out of it. Squeeze every bit of truth I can. Let me learn something that's worth the pain I'm suffering. Now, don't forget that. Lord, let me learn something that is worth the pain that I'm going through at this particular time. And then you start to your will to him. That's, that's always the right response. Okay, God, I don't understand maybe fully, but I'm, I yield myself to you. Whatever you have in mind, God, I know has to be good for me because I'm one of your children. So I'm trusting you. I'm, I'm going to lay it down before you. I'm going to believe that you know what's best for my life and that you have the best plan for me, whether I understand it or not. So I'm going to surrender myself to him. And then rest by faith in his faithfulness. Lord, I don't understand it all. I wish I did, but I don't. But I'm going to rest in your faithfulness. And his faithfulness means that he is trustworthy in every single situation. He will do exactly what he promised to do. For example, you're saying, I don't know what to do, where to go in this area. And he says, I will guide you with my eye upon you. I will teach you in the way which you should go. Do you believe he'll do that? Do you believe that God is faithful? Then going through adversity? I can rest in his faithfulness that he's going to do what he promised to do. That in this given situation, this circumstance, though I don't like it, though I'm hurting, though it's painful, though I'm misunderstood, whatever it might be, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to rest in your faithfulness that you are going to bring me through this in a way that's pleasing and honorable to you. Then a second thing I would say is this. Some biblical truths that affirm the idea that God's goal for adversity is our spiritual growth. So think about that. Some biblical truths that affirm this idea that God's purpose in our adversity is our growing. And uh, if you think about this, it is God's most effective way for deepening our faith and commitment to Him. Because it's when we go through trials that we're forced to say, hey, I'm going to trust him or not trust him. And I'm going through some trial, and I trust him, and Satan may come in and say, well, you know, who do you think you are? God's not going to answer that. That's it. You know what? You, you just, you might as well face it. You're finished with whatever's going on in your life. No. God's going to be faithful to you no matter what. And so... Uh, uh, it's just one of those tools that God uses to strengthen our faith and our commitment to Him. And then what happens? You, you, you go through a difficult time, and God answers your prayer, sets you free, and you praise the Lord. And what happens? Watch this carefully. When He has visited you in some form of adversity, and He brings you through that, that's like He has increased the strength of the foundation of your life in your faith in Him. Because you can look back and say, well, God, you brought me through that. Thank you, Lord. 
and you brought me through that, and you brought me through that, and you brought me through that. This is why you and I meet people who are very, very strong in their faith, and they've been through all kind of things. Why? They've responded in the right way and recognized that each experience they went through was like adding to the foundation of their enduring faith that will be there and last them through the last days of their life. That's who he is. So think about this also. Uh, the area in which we're experiencing the most adversity is the area in which God is at work bringing us to spiritual maturity. The area of our life in which we're experiencing the most adversity. If I should say, how many of you today are going through some form of adversity? Oh, you know somebody who, who is. Everybody's hand probably go up. Well, ask yourself the question, uh, what's God's goal in that? What's his purpose in that? God is in the process not only of helping us understand, but he's maturing us deep down inside. It isn't something we've just read or heard. There's a spiritual godliness. There's a spiritual maturity. There's a spiritual strengthening that goes on in our life that nobody else sees. It isn't something you necessarily feel until. You know when you feel it? The next time you hit one of those bad times and you test it and you try it, and then you realize, well, thank you, Jesus. I don't feel like I used to feel. Uh, so, somehow I, I can see how you're in this. We mature on the inside, invisibly, but not invisible to God. And so it's the will of God that we continue to grow in our Christian life more and more. And it's going to be determined by two things. Two things. Either that I see all this hurt and pain as an opportunity between God and myself to, to grow in my Christian life, or I see it as an obstacle. Listen, Jesus living within you through the Holy Spirit is there to teach and give understanding and enable you, help you, strengthen you in your relationship to Him. To grow, to become stronger, have deeper understanding, and listen, to grow in our loving relationship to Almighty God. It's an opportunity, not an obstacle. It's only an obstacle when I see it as an obstacle rather than an opportunity. And I suffer the consequences of unbelief and have to face it. So how do you face adversity in your life? Just think about it for a moment. Believing that God is in it and that he's going to be with you in it and he will walk with you through it every single day necessary until he brings you through now, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, let me tell you, friend. I don't know how you think you're going to live in this world and this life without Christ. And be happy and have joy and peace in your life you're not going to. You may be trying to cover up your adversity, and people do, with alcohol, drugs, sex, money and on we can go. None of that, none of that can satisfy the human heart. Only a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And you can say anything you want to say about those things and how necessary they are. No, they're not. The one thing that is absolutely necessary for life that peace and joy and happiness and contentment, even in difficult, trying, adversarial times. It's a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, which begins the moment you willing to confess your sinfulness and say to him, tell him as best you know how that you do believe that his death on the cross and the shedding of his blood brought about your forgiveness. Now understand, listen carefully. God's only begotten Son, Jesus, came into this world for the primary purpose of laying down his life 
in order that you and I could be saved and one of these days go to heaven. And on the cross, he bore your penalty and mine for all of our sins and the sins of the whole world. He was crucified. And the shedding of blood was the shedding of his life. That was God's requirement that the sinless, perfect, virgin born Son of God, sent into this world for the purpose of dying for our sins, went to the cross, died on the cross and paid your sin debt in full completely. And as a result, when you accept him as your personal Savior, your sins are atoned for for all eternity. Now, let's take the cross out of the scene. And you die and face God. It's you and your sins standing before holy God. And listen carefully, you have no claim. You have no excuse. You can't come up with enough good works and say you deserve it because the truth is none of us do. But it's Jesus and his death at the cross that paid your sin to in full. And if you die without him, it will be an eternal mistake. And I want to encourage you, whatever adversity you're going through, to recognize that isn't God being against you. That's God putting pressure on you. So you'll turn to him and have the gift of eternal life. And Father, how grateful we are that your gift of eternal life is large enough to include everybody in the entire world. And your love is great enough to include everybody in the whole world. And we humble ourselves before you and acknowledge it's not because we deserve it, but because you love us that we have the gift of forgiveness and cleansing. So I pray today for those who are going through some adversity in their life, that their first response or their response having heard this will be to turn to you and ask you to give them wisdom to help them understand what they're suffering in life. And Lord, this world is full, filled, running over, jammed, crammed, packed with adversity. Show those of us who are believers, followers of yours, how to be a blessing, God, to those about us in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've been blessed by today's program, please visit us at InTouch.org. Okay. Hey guys, I just got these blessed to be memory verse cards. No. All right. This is the end of this video. It's a sermon for the week. What I just... Today is Sunday, July 26th. 2020, God, that sounds so disproportionate. 2020, it's been a very good year. It's been a very good year. I don't want to make this video to me. But it's been a very good year. Oh, my goodness. 